Now there is a reason no establishment politician will say a word about the war industry. Because if you do, you end up like Ralph Nader, tossed into the political wilderness. Nader was not afraid to speak this truth. And it is in the wilderness, I'm afraid, that real socialists must, for the moment, reside. Socialists understand that if we do not dismantle the war industry, nothing, absolutely nothing will change. Indeed, things will only get worse. War is a business. Imperial wars seize natural resources on behalf of corporations and ensure the profits of the arms industry. And this is as true in Iraq as it was in our campaigns of genocide against Native Americans. As A. Philip Randolph said, it is only when it is impossible to profit from war that wars will be dramatically curtailed if not stopped. No one is sitting in the boardroom of General Dynamics hoping for peace in the Middle East. No one in the Pentagon, especially the generals who build their careers by managing wars, prays for a cessation of conflict. War, wrapped in the cant of nationalism and the euphoria that comes with a giddy celebration of power and violence, is used by ruling elites to thwart and destroy the aspirations of working men and women and distract us from our own disempowerment. Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder, and that is war in a nutshell, said the five-time socialist presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs during World War I. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. Debs, who in 1912 received almost a million votes, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for saying this. I've been accused of obstructing the war, Debs said in court. I admit it. I abhor war. I would oppose war if I stood alone. Debs, who spent 32 months in prison until 1921, also delivered to many a socialist credo at his sentencing after being found guilty of violating the Espionage Act. Your Honor, he said, years ago, I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I say then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. While there is a soul in prison, I am not free. The capitalist class and its doppelgangers in the military establishment have carried out what John Ralston Saul calls a coup d'etat in slow motion. The elites have used war as a safety valve for class conflict. For war, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, creates an artificial community of interest between the oligarchs and the poor diverting the poor from their natural interests. The redirecting of national frustrations and emotions into the struggle against a common enemy, the cant of patriotism, the endemic racism that is the fuel of all ideologies that sustain war, the false bonding that comes with a sense of comradeship seduces many on the margins of society. They feel, in wartime, for perhaps the first time, that they belong, they feel they have a place. 
They are offered the chance to be heroes, and off they march like sheep to the slaughter. By the time they found out, it is too late. Modern totalitarianism can integrate the masses so completely into the political structure through terror and propaganda that they become the architects of their own enslavement, Dwight MacDonald wrote. This does not make slavery less, but on the contra contrary more, a paradox there is no space to unravel here. Bureaucratic collectivism, not capitalism, is the most dangerous future enemy of socialism. War, as Randolph Bourne wrote, is the health of the state. It allows the state to accrue to itself power and resources that in peacetime a citizenry would never permit. And this is why the war state, like the one we live in, has to make certain that we are always afraid. Constant violence by the war machine, we are assured, will alone make us safe. Any attempt to rein in spending or expanding power will profit the enemy. It was the militarists and the capitalists at the end of World War II who conspired to roll back the gains made by working men and women under the New Deal. They used the rhetoric of the Cold War to cement into place an economy geared towards total war, even in peacetime. This permitted the arms industry to continue to make weapons with guaranteed profits from the state and permitted the generals to continue to preside over their fiefdoms. The incestuous relations between the corporatists and the militarists, see retired generals and officers offered lucrative jobs in the war industry once they retire. The manufacturing of weapon systems and the waging of war is today the chief activity of the state. It is no longer one among other means of advancing the national interest, but has become the sole national interest. And these corporatists and militarists are the enemy of all socialists. They bankrolled and promoted movements in the early 20th century that called for reforms within the structures of capitalism. They spoke that these movements that spoke in the language of, quote, the politics of productivism, that eschewed the language of class conflict and talked only about economic growth and a partnership with the capitalist class. The NAACP, for example, was formed to lure African Americans away from the Communist Party, the only radical organization that in the early 20th century did not discriminate. The AFL-CIO was fed CIA money to help crush and supplant radical unions abroad and at home. The AFL-CIO, like the NAACP, is today a victim of its own corruption and bureaucratic senility. Its bloated leadership pulls down huge salaries as its dwindling rank and file is stripped of benefits and protections. And the capitalists no longer need what they once called responsible unionism, which meant pliable unionism. And once the capitalists and the militarists killed off the radical movements and unions, they finished off the dupes who had helped them do it. And that is why less than 12% of our country's workforce is unionized. It is why we have such vast income disparities and chronic unemployment and underemployment. Surplus labor, desperate for work, and unwilling to challenge the bosses in the hope that they will retain a job is the bulwark of capitalism. The radicals such as the industrial workers of the world or Wobblies founded by Mother Jones and Big Bill Haywood in 1905 were destroyed by the state. Department of Justice agents in 1912 made simultaneous raids on 48 IWW meeting halls across the country and arrested 165 union leaders. 101 went to trial. 
including Big Bill Haywood, who testified for three days. One of the union leaders told this to the court. You ask me why the IWW is not patriotic to the United States. If you were a bum without a blanket, if you had left your wife and kids when you went west for a job and had never located them since, if your job had never kept you long enough in a place to qualify you to vote, if you slept in a lousy, sour bunkhouse and ate food just as rotten as they could give you and get by with, if deputy sheriffs shot your cooking cans full of holes and spilled your grub on the ground, if your wages were lowered on you when the bosses thought they had you down, if there was one law for Ford, Sewer, and Mooney, and another for Harry Thaw, if every person who represented law and order in the nation beat you up, railroaded you to jail, and the good Christian people cheered and told them to go do it, how in hell do you expect a man to be patriotic? The Wobblies once led strikes involving hundreds of thousands of workers and preached an uncompromising doctrine of class war. And the Wobblies went the way of the passenger pigeon. The Socialist Party in 1912 had 126,000 members, 1,200 office holders in 340 municipalities, and 29 English and 22 foreign language weeklies along with three English and six foreign language dailies. It included in its ranks tenant farmers, garment workers, railroad workers, coal miners, hotel and restaurant workers, dock workers, and lumberjacks, and it too was liquidated by the state. Socialist leaders were jailed or deported. Socialist publications such as the masses and appeal to reason were banned, and the assault aided later by McCarthyism, has left us without the vocabulary to make sense of our own reality, to describe the class war being waged against us by our corporate oligarchs. And it has left us without the radical movements that, as Howard Zinn made clear, opened up all of the spaces in American democracy. We will regain this militancy, this uncompromising commitment to socialism, or the system the political philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls inverted totalitarianism, will establish the most efficient security and surveillance state in human history and a species of neo-feudalism. And we must stop pouring our energy into mainstream political campaigns because the game is rigged. We will rebuild our radical movements, or we will become hostages to the capitalists and the masters of war. Fear is the only language the power elite understands. This is a dark fact of human nature. It is why Richard Nixon was our last liberal president. Nixon was not a liberal. He was devoid of empathy and lacked a conscience, but he was frightened of movements. And you do not make your enemy afraid by selling out. You make your enemy afraid by refusing to submit, by fighting for your vision, and by organizing. For it is not our job to take power. It is our job to build movements to keep power in check.